You yeah, you, you are for sure the most handsome of yeah, us. Yeah. We're not even gonna. We're not Put even all gonna, the cameras on Max. We're not even yeah. gonna clip over to us. We're just gonna yeah. run Max's voice or face the entire. No, I'm gonna. Time. I'm gonna have some fun with. I'm gonna have some fun with this opening here. Oh. I bet your your audience is probably predominantly male though. Right? No, no, half and half. Half and half. Seriously, yeah, yeah. dude, ladies yeah. love us. First off, <laughs> yeah, we're handsome as hell. <laughs> yes, so. I, I can't explain it, Co-sign. but they do. <laughs> yeah. like no, we that. are. We're fifty. I mean, Justin and I bring the average up. Big time. That's it. Half of half of our audience. Sal needs us. Biological male. The other half it just identifies as male. <laughs> <laughs> but we, that, yeah. Way to offend 50% yeah. of our audience. On a survey. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I the, love that it's half female, though. That I mean, that that's a really good sign. It shows that you guys are, you know. We're in, in touch with it. Exhibiting still. traits that some would describe as feminine, but which I think, you know, are, you know, perhaps encompass like warmth and empathy and things like that. Understanding. Well, I, you know, health, uh, the one thing I love about the health, the topic of health or the, the, the category of health is it, it it's important to everybody. So I can talk to anybody about it. And if I do a good job communicating it, male, female, you know, Republican, Democrat, Christian, atheist, uh, they're interested in well, improving their health. The, the, so. tr- the truth is, uh, I would say that we're more experts on training the human body than we are the male body. Oh, you I mean, mean the female body? Yeah. Did I, would I say male? Human, human. female. Uh, fe- yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just went real general there. Yeah. That's male, fine. Male body is not that. The <laughs> organism called female. The female body. Because, Most clients were female. Yeah. You, you, at least 65 to 75% of your clients are female. Interesting. Yeah. Men are way less likely to hire a personal trainer. They're less way, likely to yeah. ask for help. Yeah. So, wow. you know, yeah, exactly. they got it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got it. I got well, it. I got this, bro. Yeah. yeah so, so when you think about uh, all the decades of training all of us have under our belt, I mean, we've for sure helped way more women than we have men. So I think that's probably why. Did we've learned to communicate true. Max, better. did you hear about the organic farmer um, who he got busted because he was, and I, I believe his crops uh, made up about 10% of the organic market, and they got found out that they weren't organic. Wow. Got sentenced to 10 years in jail. And committed suicide. Oh my god! Yeah, actually, do you guys you didn't hear about this guy? I did not hear. No, but that he made a, his crops made up ten percent of the organic. It's like so a massive, huge. like a big percentage of. Maybe wow. Doug can look it up when uh, it was ten percent. I remember when you read wow. it. Yeah, yeah, it was ten yeah. percent. So you didn't hear about that? Well, I mean, I don't wish suicide on anybody, but what a fraud! I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's not crazy. good. Terrible. You said you've been getting in arguments with people over organic stuff. Not argument, and not people. I mean, that makes it sound like you know bigger than it is. But yeah, I've gotten into tiffs on Instagram. You know, <laughs> when I we when like I <laughs> when I yeah, we love tiffs um, because you know I I like to recommend to people that they buy organic when it's certain crops when we're talking about certain crops and i don't you know i don't think organic is as important when talking about animal-based products and things like that but you know if you're going to eat the skin or the peel i make the recommendation to go organic i like supporting organic farming i think it's better for the soil Mm. but then you know some of these like uh evidence nazis come out of the woodwork and um you know, they, they'll cite data showing that it's really unclear whether or not there are any health benefits to uh, organic food and that it is also unclear as to whether or not organic is better for the environment. If you look at certain certain metrics, you know, mm-hmm. organic farming takes more land. Um, it's less volume centric in terms of what uh, the, the amount of food that's produced. Um, and it's also unclear in terms of whether or not there's a, a nutritional benefit in terms of vitamins or minerals. So mm. you'll see higher levels of certain vitamins like vitamin C, I believe, in organic, but you'll see uh, less in in conventional produce. But then there's like, you know, there are other vitamins and minerals that are higher in conventional mm. that are lower in organic. Um, so the data is not fully there. You do, there are pesticides that are approved for use in organic. Uh, they're not synthetic, however, you know, synth- you'll get the synthetic pesticides and conventional, which everybody knows. Um, but I'm just like less likely to give the benefit of the doubt to these huge, right. you know, the, the, the food industrial complex, you know, we have yet to do long-term population studies, you know, looking at, uh, herbicides like glyphosate in people over the long term. It's not as studied in children. It's not as studied in pregnant women. We don't have any like generational that. studies. We don't have any generation, generational studies. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm just more, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm quicker to embrace organic. And in terms of the health benefits, they do tend to have higher levels of certain compounds like polyphenols and things like that, which, uh, you know, it would be assumed that they're going to, that those compounds are going to be good for human health. Now, the data that I like to talk about when, com- when debating organic versus non-organic, studies do show that people who consume organic foods have lower measurable levels of pesticides in their system. Yeah. Now, the argument can be made, 
does that matter? It's not. We don't know if it's good or bad. Right. Is it benign? But, okay, but here's the thing. It's there. It's yeah. there. Mm-hmm. And they've done studies where they've taken people, families, and moved them off of conventional you know, produce and vegetables, moved them to organic, and then you can see the amount of pesticides found in their system decline over time. So that to me says, uh, okay, we'll, I don't know. I'd rather like you err on the side of natural than on the side of synthetic. And you're right that there are no real long-term studies, especially not generational ones. Like glyphosates have an interesting effect on bacteria and uh, like antibiotics, low-dose antibiotic use, you start to see the effects like two or three generations later with less and less diverse microbiota and potential issues. So- you know, I, okay, who knows? That's their that's their defense. We don't know. The evidence doesn't really show anything. Okay, then that means I'm going to err on the side of safety. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I'm just not willing to give these synthetic compounds the benefit the benefit of the doubt. And another argument that would be, see, I like to present both sides of the of the of the issue because I think it is complex, right? You know, in those studies where they'll switch kids or adults to organic diets and they see this this reduction in pesticides in their urine. The question then becomes like, what pesticides are they testing for? Are they testing for the pesticides that are approved for use in organic Mm. agriculture? Maybe not. Um, But, you know, one of the issues with compounds like glyphosate is that they are, you know, suspected endocrine disruptors. And endocrine disruptors, one of the things that makes them most treacherous, and I think we talked about this the last time that I was here, is that they don't necessarily follow the typical linear dose makes the poison paradigm where... You know, you might have a very high dose of an endocrine disruptor that has overt toxicity, but then you might see them having an effect at a low dose, you know, that's much different than the dose that you would see at a high dose. I see. And so that kind of allows these compounds to subvert political scrutiny, scientific scrutiny. And when you look at the amount of money, basically, that's that goes into them and the fact that, again, as you mentioned, we didn't we don't have these generational studies. You got to, I mean, at a certain point you like throw up your hands and you're like, what am I supposed to do? Well, I like to opt when I can for, you know, when it's produce where I'm eating the whole thing organic, because I know that, um, that, you know, the, 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 the pesticides that they're using, they, they only use them when they absolutely have to. And organic farmers that I know, you know, they, they're very dedicated to regenerative agriculture and, um, and the pesticides come from natural sources. And, you know, some might, some might say, well, you know, there's no uh, proof that natural pesticides are any are any safer than organic pesticides. Well, some of, mm-hmm. some of the pesticides that they use are actually plant-derived. And some of the healthiest compounds in plants are actually the pesticides that they create for themselves to mm-hmm. ward off predators and things like that. So, um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's just like you got to make a decision at the end of the day. And so when it comes to the foods where the, the produce where I'm eating the skin or the peel, that's when I, that's when I buy organic. That, back to the endocrine uh, disruptors. Now that for, for the audience who might not know that's those are compounds that can affect or influence the hormone system in the body. What about really low dose, long duration exposure to endocrine disruptors? You may notice very subtle effects, right? Like a little bit of feminization or, more fat storage in places that you might not normally store body fat or going through puberty earlier. And how do you test for that? Like, how do I, how do I test and show that, okay, uh, the average child is going through puberty now at a younger age, which is actually true. That's actually happening. Some of that's related to fat storage, but we don't know men's testosterone levels, right? Like, I don't know if I test somebody that their testosterone level is, you know, 15% lower than it could have been. I don't know that, but we do know that testosterone levels have been declining across the board now for the last few decades. It's one of those things. It's kind of difficult to, to study in the traditional sense of, you know, six months and see what happens because we're consuming these things for decades and decades and decades. Um, and we do know that they do affect or interact with, that's the fact. That's why they're called endocrine disruptors. They, we know for a fact that they in, interact with the hormone system. We just don't know. We can't say with certainty how much or how bad with some of these things. Am I, yeah. am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the dose that we're getting um, that has been deemed safe by our most... First of all, the 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 it was just recently revealed, and I can't cite the exact study, but that, you know, we have way... We likely have way higher levels of these compounds in us at any given time than we had previously thought just because of updates to the testing methods and things like that. Um, and even at the dose at which we're regularly exposed to these compounds, they, they are likely having an effect. I mean, there was a study that I posted on Twitter just today where, um, 
they found that in normal healthy people, they gave people a dose of BPA, which is not, uh, you know, it wasn't like a mega dose. They could, they wouldn't be able to do that for ethical reasons. So they mm. gave them a dose at which, you know, a dose that the FDA says that if you're on a daily basis exposed to this this amount of BPA over the course of your lifetime, you're safe. Well, what they found was when they gave that dose of BPA along with an oral glucose tolerance test, they had a, an altered insulin response. Mm. And so that was an effect. That was an effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know that these compounds are powerful, uh, what are called xenoestrogens. They act like estrogen in the body. Um, there are certain cancers, you know, like breast cancer for one, that is sensitive. Certain types of breast cancer are sens certain breast tumors are sensitive to estrogen. Um, but estrogen has an effect on glucose metabolism. I mean, you know, if you've got too little estrogen, you develop insulin resistance. If you have too much estrogen, you develop insulin resistance. So it's a... Uh, it's just not a smart move to try to to be tinkering with this system of hormones in the body, which are so finely tuned and so sensitive, you know. Mm. And then we've just got these chemicals that we're exposed to on a daily basis. And if it was just like one compound here or there, I don't think that you know maybe it wouldn't be such a big deal. But we're just we're inundated. Our exposures are just unprecedented, like in evolutionary, you know, on on the human time scale. Whether if it's if it's not BPA, it's phthalates. If it's not phthalates, it's PFAS compounds and, you know, in, uh, that are used to basically create like waxy, the waxy linings of papers that we, you know, wrap our burgers or burritos with or, or like the, you receipts. know, receipts. Yeah. Or receipts, which are coded in BPA. There was a, they found in 2014 that, um, if you use a hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer basically like opens up the pores in your skin, thus like dramatically making more permeable your skin to environmental toxins. If you use hand sanitizer before touching one of these store receipts, which is very common, like millions of people do this, then you're basically by at least an order of magnitude increasing your exposure to BPA. Oh, wow. Cool. You know how interesting that is to me? Because just in the last, I, th I want to say year, maybe two years tops, uh, it's like almost standard at every grocery store. As soon as you walk in, they have those alcohol chemical wipes yes, and sanitizer. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like, and we never had that before. And yeah. Katrina's routine, she gets, as soon as she gets a cart, she walks over to the hand, wipes, sanitizes, wipes hands, and then goes in, in there. So n now hearing that, that I'm like, you more susceptible. Oh my God, dude. Oh, no. What yeah. a fucking death trap. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's great. So with the, with your, your first book, very popular. You've been on lots of mainstream TV shows. I've seen you on uh, The Doctors and Dr. Oz, and you're very popular. You've got this other book that's coming out now, um, which you know uh, we've looked at, and it's uh, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's going to do actually better than your first book. Are you seeing more, because you talked earlier about getting a little bit of pushback from different segments of the health space, whether it's the fitness space, uh, you know, because of the, the macro zealots coming after you or whatever. Are you seeing more of that? Are you getting more of that? Like you're now somebody people are going to fight or go after? Yeah. The thing is, there's like all these different factions in our space, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've yeah. The, you've got the vegan community. I mean, I've fucking duked it uh. out. Can I curse? I've, I've, yes. I've, 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 I've duked it out Fuck with yeah. them. Um, and I have nothing against like vegans in general. You know, we've discussed this, but they have, I mean, one the other day called me a literally in, in quotes called me a literal cancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, they're wow. just they're angry and they come at you. And I'm pretty. I've got pretty thick skin. I grew up in New York City, right? But yeah. I'm still human. And so when things like when when people come at me, it's uh, you know, I feel compelled to respond. Um, Why they call you a cancer? Because I posted a, I posted somebody on Instagram. You're like the nicest guy I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so funny to hear that. It doesn't make any sense. He's like the nicest yeah. man in the world. Yeah. Um, trying to help people. I'm trying to help people. Yeah. So somebody posted a, uh, uh, like it was a photo of their bookshelf, like a stack of books on a coffee table. And um, the caption was, these books have changed my life. I recommend everybody read these books. And you, you go through the books and it's like a who's who, a vegan, known <laughs> vegan proselytist, doctors and whatever. It was like forks over knives. It was the Alzheimer's solution. It was like uh, the China study. It was like all these books. And so I, I took a screen grab because I thought it was, this is what's wrong with like the world is that we, we, it's like we, all we do is we seek out our, our own confirmation biases. Right, right? Right, right. And so I took a screen grab 
and I put it on my stories and I was like, man, if this isn't like a literary echo chamber, I don't know what is. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to see anything good about meat or any animal product whatsoever written about in any of these books, thousands of pages of, of, of whatever writing represented there and all just with the same message. And I was like, that is so messed up. Yeah. Um, and then so, the tiki torches came out and the tiki torches. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually not, it was just that one person. It was just that one person who replied and said, you're a little literal cancer. Uh, you don't have the clinical experience to know the truth and yada, yada, yada. And so, and I think I even shared that on my Instagram because I was like, look guys, like, do we, do we have to be like this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I think one of the, one of the best possible things you can do in with any subject where you have an opinion that's formed is to seek out someone who has the opposing opinion, who's intelligent and compelling and see if they can change your mind. Honestly, be open to seeing if, if they can change your mind. Oftentimes, you'll come out with new information. They might not change your mind, but if they did, that means the previous opinion you had mm. was wrong anyway. Yeah. I don't know why more people don't do that. Well, that's exactly, I mean, not to, not to like pat myself on the back, but that's what I, that's what I try to do. Like the, we started the conversation about the organic and I was giving all the disclaimers about, because I got into an actual, it got me to think differently about sure. just like, you know, this, the, the, the sweeping generalization that organic is better. Well, if we're talking about like beef, it doesn't necessarily make as big of a difference, you know, for that, you really just want to look for grass fed, but at the end of the day, I think you've got to make decisions and, you know, and so I'll, I'll offer that as a disclaimer, but too few people are willing to do that yeah. to challenge. I would own. say the, the vegan segment of uh, the vegan faction is probably the, one of the more uh, aggressive, but that's because behind their, their opinion and belief uh, in how they eat, it's not just this way of eating makes me feel better. Like you talk to keto zealots and it's like this, you know, made me feel better and it transformed my life and they're very passionate. With vegans, they some of many of them firmly believe they're saving that, lives. Yeah, that they're saving lives, and now they're saving the planet, according to them. Right. So, so those they, those two of them is what causes I think them to be that way. Yeah. So I would assume that that's probably where you're getting a lot most of your uh, opposition. Yeah, there is like a significant overlap between veganism and mental illness too, mm. and I'm not just saying that. And the direction of causality is it's probably omni, you know, it's probably multi-directional because the vegan the vegan diet I think probably attracts in many ways people who have mental health issues uh -huh. and then you go on this diet that is not providing triggered. nutrients. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm very triggered right now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then they go on this diet that's like, you know, it, it's harder to get B12, it's harder to get all these like nutrients that we know are very good for the brain. I would and then say it exacerbates those yeah, problems. And I would say any yeah. any extreme uh, belief probably is going to attract more of that segment of the population with a little bit of, you know, maybe mental uh, issues, uh, mental health, prob uh, health problems. But in particular with veganism, um, the way that I've talked about it with some people is that it, it, in some cases it may be misplaced empathy. And what I mean by that is, because um, I don't doubt the empathy of someone who says I don't want to kill animals. I think that they're very genuine in what they're saying. But I think sometimes it's misplaced because they'll uh, they'll disregard the empathy for their own selves. Right. And I've seen this with clients. I've had clients who are so empathetic towards animals that they will sacrifice their own physical health, like glaring at them where, the, where doctors are looking at them. And I've worked with them and their doctors. And they're like, if you don't eat, you're not going to menstruate again if you don't have meat. If you don't take these nutrients, your hair is going to continue to fall out. And this is not everybody, but for some people this has happened. I've seen this. Mm -hmm. And they will they will not empathize themselves. They will not say, I need to take care of myself. They only empathize with animals. And so I think that's a, there's a little bit of something going on there with that misplaced. Well, we also did, we just did an episode yep. uh, that I think just went up the other day. Uh, and we, we looked up the top 10 uh, nutrient deficiencies. And the common theme about all 10 of them is like the number one source of getting those nutrient de nutrient deficiencies solved was through meat. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you have to really try to find a plant source of that. It's just difficult. Like, unless you're really yeah. doing your homework. You have to supplement. Yeah, it's really, really tough. That's all. I think but that's all it is. You can do it now. Modern markets allow you the ability to. Well, you could do it, but you have to yeah. do your homework. And yeah, in my yeah. experience, because of the documentaries like What the Health and uh, Game, the other, Changers. And Game Changers, you've got people like my niece, who's, you know, 17, and, you know, it motivates her. to, st And then her way of going vegan is just cutting out meats, you know, and just now eating salads and more. And it's like, there's no, she's not going and doing her research right. on, oh, now that I've completely eliminated this nutrient dense food, what am I potentially lacking yeah. in? Like, that's not, and I'm not talking to the, 
the hardcore vegan who's doing it to save animal lives and has done all their research and falls and is healthy. Awesome. Good for you. Like, yeah. keep doing it. I'm more concerned about the masses and that the this general uh, message that's coming from these documentaries that are getting the average person who's not doing any homework yeah. whatsoever switching over well, because they think they're saving the earth, yet they're eating avocados in Minnesota that was shipped from fucking Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the, the, the rising uh, popularity of the carnivore diet now as the, the counter to that, Max? Yeah, I mean, I think that they, you know, people, there's no doubt that people are at least anecdotally seeing reprieve from pretty serious autoimmune conditions on it, but I'm not... Uh, I don't think that that's optimal either for most people. I think <laughs> right. that, you know, I think that you get, um, it's like, you know, there's these. How very reasonable of you, Max. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I was looking for a shocking answer. No, I mean, yeah, that's why, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you get all these like xenohormetic compounds in plants, like the polyphenols that I was talking about yeah. before that, you know, I think are uh, in many ways like the heavy hitters in terms of the health benefit that we see from plants. I mean, the, the benefits that we get from plants are not just in the vitamins and minerals, the handful of vitamins and minerals that we know that we need from plants. They're in the, you know, in the metabolites that we get from our microbiota when they ferment the fiber that we consume when we're eating plant matter, where uh, get, you know, the polyphenols that are also metabolized by the microbiota and that some of them enter circulation and, and are good for us. The plant pigments that we know are good for the brain. I like, I love to talk about compounds like lutein and zeaxanthin, which are um, the ye yellows and oranges that you'll see in the produce section that uh, are really important for preventing age-related macular degeneration. But they've also recently been shown in, in, in clinical trials to boost brain processing speed. Mm. Um, yeah. And your average adult consumes like, I think, two milligrams of combined lutein and zeaxanthin a day. If you, com if you consume six, that significantly helps protect your eyes as you age. And 12 seems to, you know, even in young people, provide a visual processing speed boost. So that's why I'm always like eat a big salad every yeah. day. What, you're, what you'll find with the extreme uh, diets is rather than being, for example, rather than vegans being pro-plant, it's anti-meat. And rather than carnivores being pro-meat, they're just anti-plant. Right. And so that's where I start to, th I think you start to see the problems because you're missing out on some potential incredible benefits. But there are those outliers that seem to do better Avoiding whole swaths of uh, you know categories of food or whatever. Yeah, it's uh, just it's just like the irony that you've got like these these super loud and aggressive factions, but you know the 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 animal haters like the vegans can't prove with any good evidence that uh, abstaining from animal products is going to be any better for your health, and the carnivores can't prove you know with the available evidence that abstaining from plants is going to be any better for your health. Just so like Democrats should, and Republicans. Now, yeah. let's have them wrestle. So <laughs> yeah. Now, was this the, the main motivation behind the first chapter that don't fork around was this topic? Like, is this how you it led down this pathway? Because I know you talk about protein in there also. Yeah. So the first, so in Genius Foods was sort of like a, you know, it was a nutritional care manual for the brain. But in, in the genius life, the nutritional guidelines are a little bit different because what I'm trying to do with my readers is get them is to help shift their bodies to a, you know, in terms of their body composition to a more positive state and to optimize metabolic health and to basically, you know, get people to understand that their hunger mechanisms are not always don't always fall within their control. We like to think that we have the reins of, uh, you know, of our hunger. But in the modern food environment, I think that our hunger is often hijacked by ultra processed foods and by, you know, the the pervasive advice that for whatever reason, protein is bad for us, which, you know, it's not. So in this book, I think I put an emphasis on just recognizing the value of dietary protein. And I think, you know, for like that, just that simple statement right there, like listeners of your podcast are probably well aware of the value of protein. People in the fitness world are well aware, but your average person doesn't realize that protein is the most satiating macronutrient. If you make no change to your diet, other than just try to eat more protein, like prioritize protein, most people I think are going to see like a spontaneous weight loss. It's one of the yeah. first, okay, so one of the things I always like to do with clients, no matter what your goal is, uh, is in, instead of taking things away or saying you can't have is to insert things that I know they're lacking in the number one macronutrient that the general pop was lacking in when I would assess diets was protein. Yeah. It's just, I mean, if you're over 135 pounds, which most Americans are, if you're over 135 pounds, the amount of chicken breast that you would need to consume in a day is just not normal. Yeah. People aren't eating four or five chicken breasts in a single day. So, and that's what it takes to add up to that much protein. So, I would see people 
eating 30 to 50 grams of protein a day, which sure you can live off of that and you're okay, but it's not the most optimal uh, for performance building muscle. And then also it, the satiating benefits that you get so you don't end up craving all these that, other foods. It can be overstated what you just said, uh, Max, because the biggest problem with modern uh, nutrition is we can look at sugars and carbs and fats and this, but ultimately the biggest problem is we eat too much. And so seeking things out that make you not want to eat as much is a very, very good basic first step, I would say. And, and it makes sense if you think about it. Evolutionarily speaking, why would protein be so satiating? Why are fats also satiating? Not as much as proteins, but a little bit, but more than carbs. And why are carbs typically the least satiating? Probably because proteins and fats are essential. And if you eat lots of carbs, your body's hunger mechanisms are going to continue to, to kick up to try to motivate you to eat those essential amino acids that you can only find from eating you know, uh, outside of yourself. You have to eat protein. So it makes perfect sense. But yeah, as a trainer, when I'd have someone bump their protein, I would watch their calories naturally drop just by prioritizing that. Yeah. Well, what are some other tips and things you talked about in that in that chapter? I talk about the value of salt and sodium. Um, one of the topics that I cover in the book across all of the chapters is the value of maintaining a healthy blood pressure, oh. uh, which all the research seems to be pointing to is crucial for having a brain that not only performs well, but ages well, uh, which as you guys know, I mean, you know, maintaining brain health as we age or, you know, even optimizing brain health is something that's is I'm super passionate about. And so this whole idea that salt is somehow this cardiovascular demon, I like to remind people that sodium is a nutrient. And um, there's actually a fairly large uh, meta-analysis that was recently published. I believe it was either 2019 uh, or 2018 that found that actually people who are on the most salt-restricted res diets have the highest risk of death. Mm. And the lowest risk mm. seems to be when people consume about three to five um, grams of sodium per day, which is about, which is at least double what the American Heart Association recommends. The, the American Heart Association Association recommends we consume about one and a half grams, no more, of sodium per day. But you know, the most people consume salt in the f in by way of ultra processed foods, you know, or canned foods or preserved foods, which are just loaded with sodium. So it's not that you know your average American needs to eat more salt. I mean, your average American's already eating you know lots and lots of salt, but because they're consuming. 60% of their calories from ultra processed foods. So once you cut those foods out of your diet, I think it's crucially important to make sure that you're getting adequate salt. Everybody that's ever done like a, uh, or initiated a low carb diet knows that they experience that low carb flu occasionally. And I think that can be mitigated by adding more sodium into the diet because the minute your insulin levels drop, your kidneys spill sodium. Mm. Um, so this is something that when you're eating an optimized you know, in air quotes diet that's built primarily on whole foods, which I know that you guys advocate mm -hmm. advocate for, salt is something that becomes crucially important. Eating eating more salt. Not only that, but salt makes our food palatable. Is there yeah. a hierarchy of quality in terms of like salts you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, what they're showing now is increasingly around the world, uh, sea salts are contaminated with microplastics. Mm. Um, and so we already, you know, I mean, we're exposed to plastic compounds on a daily basis. I, when I'm traveling, I mean, you know, I'm drinking out of a water bottle right now that is made of plastic. I, you know, we can't, we can't always avoid it. Um, but you know, in terms of the salt that we use, I think, you know, if you can avoid sea salt in your home, that's probably a good thing. Um, I'm not really a fan of these like iodized ultra processed salts. They usually use like anti caking agents. Some of them have like these aluminum, you know, based ingredients. So, I, yeah, I'll go for like a Himalayan, like a pink salt or like a, a more mineral rich salt that I find like at my supermarket. Yeah, because the sea salts, they collect it from the ocean, dry it out. But because there's plastics and pollutants in the ocean, they end up in the salt. Yeah. Right? That's what's happening. And then the Himalayan ones, they're pulling them out of ancient mines, you know, before we ever produced any plastics. So these are pure. Yeah. So like, a, you know, an example of a company, you know, Real Salt, they, you know, they, uh, Redmond Real Salt, they, they, their salt comes from an underground mine in Utah, mm -hmm. which is obviously going to be pristine and untouched mm -hmm. by pollution. The other thing about that meta-analysis, they found that people at, a, at very high sodium consumption, they did have, a, have an increased risk of heart disease, but only when they didn't consume adequate potassium. So potassium the is- The balance. The balance. Yeah. It's super important. Very interesting. Yeah. So when you don't eat, a, uh, and I notice this myself, when my, my processed food consumption goes down, 
uh, my sodium drops way down naturally and I just add salt to my food. So that's really the advice is, hey, when you're not eating lots of heavily processed food, make sure you add quality salt to the foods that you do, the whole foods that you do eat. Yeah, or just don't be afraid of it. Add mm-hmm. salt to taste. I mm-hmm. mean, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, grow up not enjoying eating vegetables because they're just not seasoned properly. Mm-hmm. So salt is a very important, I think, culinary device to get us to eat more vegetables for one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, certain, certain things that people do cause them to lose more salt. I mentioned the low carb diet, certain medications, I believe, uh, SSRIs actually can cause us, can act like a diuretic, can cause us to excrete, um, sodium, which, you know, a non-trivial portion of the population are on, um, caffeine, vigorous exercise, uh, sweating, you lose primarily salt, sodium in your sweat. So, uh, making sure that you're, you know, keeping your electrolytes, your electrolyte intake up, I think is important. And then. The other thing of the but yeah, the other aspect of the chapter that I talk about, um, which I know that you guys talk about all the time and we're pretty aligned, is just basically letting people know what ultra processed do, foods do to your hunger. In the first book, Genius Foods, I kind of talked to I introduced this concept of hyperpalatability and how these foods short circuit your your brain's like reward centers. Um but now we actually have like really good data from the National Institutes of Health. There was that great study that was published by uh, obesity re- researcher Kevin Hall, who found that an ultra processed food based diet actually causes us to overconsume about 500 additional calories a day. That was a, that was a mm-hmm. crossover study. They even switched yeah. the groups, and they saw when one group was eating less because they weren't eating the heavily processed foods, and then they switched over to the process. They also consumed 500 more calories. It was consistent across the board. Yeah, you shared that study like what a few months ago. Right? Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, we've seen this as trainers. That was right. a big one for us. Yeah. You know, you talk in your your second chapter. You get into circadian rhythm, and I wanted to ask you how important do you think that is in in the weight loss journey? I think it's super important. Um, I mean, uh, in the in the hierarchy of you know what you eat versus when you eat. I think what you eat is probably still the most important factor, but I do think that what, that, that when you eat matters in accordance with what we're learning from animal studies and from human trials in terms of, um, you know, our body's own natural inclinations to digest and metabolize food. I mean, we know that our metabolize, our metabolisms are ripping and roaring during the day. We're diurnal creatures. We're meant to consume food during the day. Peristalsis is at its fastest, um, during the day. And we know that we're at our most insulin sensitive, in the, in the daytime. So, I mean, that right there, uh, would tip you off to the, the, the possibility that, um, that our metabolisms are, are influenced by these, these rhythms, these circadian rhythms. So I talk about the value of getting good light in through your eyes first thing in the morning. I think that's really important. That's one of the chief time setters that your brain and body uses to know what time of day it is. Um, and, uh, and that hormonally can have an effect on things like insulin sensitivity and the like. Like light can actually affect how insulin sensitive you are. And we we know this because light, one of the things that light does is it suppresses the production of melatonin. And melatonin actually makes you less insulin sensitive. So when melatonin, later on in the day, it's sort of the sleep hormone. It starts to rise. It, it gets released by the pineal gland. Um, later on in the day, you actually become less uh, insulin sensitive. So to make sure that you're that your metabolism is sort of primed to be able to utilize and partition fuels, you know, at its most optimal, um, getting about a half an hour of 1000 lux of light first thing in the morning or, you know, before noon, I think is a really important, uh, you know, sort of lifestyle thing that you could do. So you think the old, the old tip of don't eat past six o'clock is actually pretty good advice then? I think it's really good advice. Now, it's not that food is necessarily like I see these posts on Instagram all the time. And I also see I've seen literally fitness influencers say that um, the time that you eat has no bearing whatsoever on your weight. And that's that's false. So, I mean, a food, a, a bagel, let's just take a bagel. You know, if it has 100 calories at 7.59 p.m., it's not going to have, you know, magically 150 calories at 8 p.m. Right. That's just not how it works. But they do, sh- research in humans has shown that circadian disruption, which can easily be achieved by eating a very late night meal, um, if you don't regularly eat late at night, can actually alter the hormones that affect the calories outside of the calories in, calories out equation. So eating late at night can disrupt leptin, which is, you know, sort of the master throttle. It's, it's the cascading effect that happens from this. And this is what's tough about studies is we, we, we take something in a small window and we just measure at eight o'clock, it still is 700 calories. Yeah. It's, and so therefore, law of thermodynamics applies. It doesn't matter. But the reality is we're not taking into account 
the cascading effect that happens. And the body's burning less calories, like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The body's burning less calories when you eat it late versus when you eat it in the day, which might be a small effect, but do that over a long period of time. Or consistently all the time, right? Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who's a midnight snacker all the time, and Mm -hmm. that's got a major compounding effect. A thousand percent. So I'm not refuting calories in, calories out, but I think too often we focus on the calories inside of the equation. When calories out, hello, that's like an important part of the story as well. Mm -hmm. And so by, you know, by eating late at night and you know, this, the suggestion in the literature that we could, uh, maybe reduce levels of leptin. I mean, that's going to have an effect on your metabolic burn. And it also can affect ghrelin, which is another hormone that controls our hunger and satiety. So the next day, I mean, eating late at night could potentially make you more hungry and, and less prone to making good, uh, food choices. There has to be a physiological difference too, because uh, very few, if anybody goes to bed at 6 p.m. at night, at 6 p.m., if you ate your last meal there, you're still up and walking and moving around for two, three hours potentially. If you eat at 11 o'clock at night, there's a good chance you're doing that sitting on your couch or laying in your bed. And there's got to be something to do. Uh, there's got to be some benefits too, just from being upright and gravity and moving around that helps the digestive process too. So I think there's that side mm-hmm. of the out cycle too, when we talk about the calories that you're intaking. Well, it all, may, it all makes sense again, from an evolutionary standpoint, point, you probably wouldn't be cooking a, a, a wonderful meal in the middle of the night when all the lions are walking around and humans <laughs> are basically blind. You probably ate it during the day and at night you shut everything down and yeah. let's go in the cave and hide. You yeah. had a term for this, right? You had uh, light was medicine and then what was the other part as, as far as like later in the day became yeah, sort the, of a detriment? Well, the idea that light, you know, in, in a certain context can actually act like a carcinogen. Mm. Um, and this is a powerful idea. And actually, this the whole the idea of light as a carcinogen. It's um, I was interviewing uh, this brilliant woman, Ellen Vora, MD, who's a, who's a holistic psychiatrist um, on my po- on my podcast. And I was familiar with the science, but she put it like that, and I was like, "Whoa, mm. that's like that's some way to think about like artificial light later on in the evening." And the reason why um, why this could actually be the case is that. Uh, melatonin, which I mentioned, you know, it is a sleep hormone. It helps us wind down, but it's not just a sleep hormone. So melatonin actually is one of the most potent antioxidants in the body. It's an epigenetic, it's involved in gene expression. Um, it also is a gatekeeper on the process known as autophagy, which, uh, you know, is important for longevity and it's when cells clean house, you know, old dysfunctional cells clean house. Um, and, uh, and, and so by, basically not allowing your melatonin to be expressed the way that it wants to be in the later evening hours, you basically are, are allowing for this uh, milieu in the body that could actually be pro carcinogenic, you know, without, without melatonin. Melatonin is an important, um, it's one of the hormones that's responsible for the reparative and restorative aspects of sleep. This is why and, swing schedules are, are carcinogenic. People who yeah. work at night and yeah. go to sleep in the day, they have a higher risk for, of cancer. They this do. is a fact. Yes. A hundred percent. So, um, so yeah, so I mean that's like a that's a hypothesis that I think warrants further testing for sure. Um, but mechanistically, you know, insofar as bright light that our ancestors that you know that that we've only really had to endure for the past hundred or so years or a couple you know a couple hundred years, um, you know, something that our ancestors did not did not know or have access to, um, maybe one you know one possible route of cancer. Uh, you know, ideology for some people. Now, what do you recommend? Do you recommend that people dim their lights at night, turn things down, wear blue blockers? Like, what are the recommendations that you have? Just be really, um, you know, deliberate about the light that you allow to enter your eyes. I mean, I think, you know, if it's, if we're talking about eye level lamps that have warm bulbs, what I did was I converted all of the bulbs in my apartment to very warm, uh, it was just a very warm hue. Mood lighting. Mood lighting, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, to me, so I live in an apartment complex in LA, and when I walk through the complex, I can sometimes kind of like see through my periphery inside other people's apartments. And I'm not I'm not actually looking, but- Peeping You got some binoculars? But, <laughs> no, no. But um, you'd be, I'm, I'm actually surprised by how many people allow their apartments to be lit by like what are essentially fluorescent lights. Oh, super yeah. bright. Yeah, super bright. <laughs> and they're like this like blue hue, and, and super bright, I mean, in the kitchen or, or various parts of the home. And so the first thing that I did when I moved into my apartment was I got rid of all the super bright um, bulbs and I made them more aesthetically pleasing. I put in these warm bulbs and, uh, and yeah, I try not to, you know, like too late at night, go to drugstores or supermarkets because the soup, the lighting in a drugstore or supermarket can easily reach a thousand lux, which tells your brain that it's daytime, mm-hmm. even, even when it's not. Um, and I love uh, blue blocker glasses. Yeah. I think they're one of the very few like sort of 
products in the health and wellness space that are actually worth their money. Um, my, I watch a lot of like TV, like at night, you know, I'll binge watch shows at my brother's house. My brother, he's got this like 80 something inch TV. It's like massive. So if I'm watching a show and it's like a daytime shot and it like flashes to the sky or whatever, the amount of light emanating from that TV, yeah. I was just messing up. my. I would think that TVs mm-hmm. and computers are up there and your phone too. Like when you're staying, how many people lay yeah. in bed and are like Instagram scrolling and texting like dark in your room, but then this bright screen on your eyes, it cannot be good. Yeah, it's not. I, there's actually an app um, and I haven't tested it with a with a with a more professional device but there's an app called Lux and uh, it's it's a cool app to install on your phone because it gives you um, you could use the front camera or the rear camera and it gives you a sense of the the amount of light intensity in your ambient environment oh wow so you yeah. can measure it you That's can measure cool, it. You can yeah, measure it. Cool. There's all kinds of like cool testing devices for your iPhone. I have something that measures the um, amount of decibels in the ambient environment because I'm very cautious about like, you know, I don't want to ever lose my hearing because mm. I'm such a music junkie. Um, so I have like an app that does that. I'm, I can measure like elevation and things like that. But the Lux, I think, comes in really useful. And what you'll notice when you have it is that even on an overcast day, the light is sufficient. So for people that live in northern, you know, uh, climates that are like, well, I can't get adequate, you know, sun during the day because, you know, it's like overcast and whatever it's winter, even on an overcast day. I mean, the amount of light that you get is sufficient to anchor your body's circadian rhythm. We use uh, Himalayan salt lamps. So we put mm-hmm. these little, uh, yes. like night lights throughout the house. And then we turn the lights off when the sun goes down and that's what we use. And it's a very warm glow. And my sleep has been so much better. And I noticed a tremendous difference with my kids. Hmm. My kids wind down and they go to bed at a decent time versus when, we're somewhere else and the lights are on real bright above our heads and I could t- everybody's sleep gets distracted. I just make a habit of every t- as soon as the sun goes down, I have three pairs of my glasses, blue blockers throughout every level of my house. That so it doesn't I don't have an excuse if I'm in my bedroom, there's a pair. If I'm down in the living room with mm-hmm. kitchen area, like there's a pair. I just throw them on as soon as the sun goes mm-hmm. down. And when I don't, I can notice a significant difference in how long it takes me to fall asleep. That's yeah. the biggest thing that I notice. Like that I can measure. It's like one of those hard things like people try it out. They're like, I don't know. Am I getting better sleep or not? I can tell how long it takes me to fall asleep, which, you know, you add that up. That's if I normally toss around for 45 minutes to an hour to probably fall asleep by just putting those on, if I knock out within the first 15 to 20 minutes, I mean, add that up over. That's hours a week. Yeah. That's hours a, a week. You also talk about, um, I think the, the name of the chapter is the vigor effect. Uh, I think it's the vigor effect or the vigor trigger. Th- there you go. And it, this has to do with, um, Stressing the body through measured, you know, applications of certain things. Talk about that for a little bit. Like, uh, like you talk about hot and cold therapy and those effects. Yeah, I think it's super important. I mean, you know, we all know the value of physical exercise, but there's another type of exercise that you know the modern human has sort of lost touch with, and that is thermal exercise. So, getting out, experiencing routine cold or even mildly cool temperatures, um, is to the benefit of our of our biology. I mean, researchers have basically taken human subjects, they've thrown them in labs, they've made them sleep there for you know months at a time, and they found that even when exposed to temperatures at around 66 degrees Fahrenheit, you start to cultivate brown fat, which is metabolically active, it burns calories, it burns fat, it burns sugar, and, um, and having more uh, brown fat on your body is associated with you know better overall metabolic health, better brain health, and things like that. Uh, so I'm a big fan of just routinely exposing my body, whether it's through cold showers, cold plunges. They're now using cold plunges as uh, you're seeing these case studies pop up in the literature of people even self-treating um, depression with cold water swimming and things like that. Uh, so I detail all of that research in the book and how just you know how important thermal exercise is. I talk about saunas a lot too. I, I was really turned on to the health benefit of saunas. Uh, by a number of studies that are coming out of the University of Eastern Finland that are showing us that saunas are just this one of the most, I think, effective healing modalities that exists. I mean, saunas are, an, I mean, you guys know, you have an infrared sauna. Actually, interestingly about infrared saunas, um, they're not actually technically, the, the International Sauna Association doesn't want them to be called saunas. Wow. Yeah, which is a really funny uh, thing. I mean, I'll, I'll use an infrared sauna because they get you to sweat and sweating is a great way to purge environmental toxins and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, when you're sitting in a sauna, you're, you're getting rid of en- potentially, uh, you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals, certain heavy metals. It acts like an exercise mimetic. I mean, if you put your finger on the radial pulse in your wrist, you'll see that your, your heart rate is getting up to a, a BPM that's like, you know, about what you would see on a treadmill, you know, going at like a mild to moderate pace. Um, it, uh, 
boosts blood flow all over the body, which is similar to when you put like a hot compress on a swollen or on a, on a, on a sprained ankle or something, it starts to get, you know, you'll see blood flow in the area. It boosts nitric oxide. So when you sit in a sauna, it does that all over your body. It boosts, you know, circulation. It's great for your brain. Um, and they're seeing that the, that regular sauna use is associated with a pretty dramatic risk reduction for cardiovascular disease, stroke, for all cause dementia, for Alzheimer's disease, um, and things like that. So yeah, it's, I, I read a study that showed a, a dramatic reduction in all cause mortality from yeah. people who used uh, sauna. For me, the biggest thing was when I used the sauna regularly, or when I would do like a cold shower or cold dip regularly, I noticed that I got better at it. So I noticed that. I could stay in a sauna for 20 minutes at a particular intensity. And then, the, you know, after a couple of weeks, I could do it for 25 or 30. Or I could withstand, you know, a, a 60 seconds under a freezing shower and eventually work my way up to, you know, three or four minutes. And what that tells me is that just like with resistance training, when I'm lifting weights and getting stronger, there's a part of my body that's adapting and strengthening. My ability to acclimate to temperature is becoming stronger, which tells me it was atrophied in the first place. And anything that's atrophied on the human body not as healthy. It's not yeah. as healthy. What's your theory on that, how it affects the immune system? Because one of the things that I felt was a, and I don't know if this is so much uh, causation or correlation, that when I did it for a consistent six months, um, I really started to notice how resilient I would be with getting sick. Like, yeah. I used to be the guy who, if one of us had a cold in here, guaranteed I'm getting sick. Just there's, I am just had a weak immune system. Ever since I started doing hot, cold contrast, um, I now my son can be sick. Katrina can be sick. I've gone two years without being sick. Like never in my life have I ever been that long without getting sick or that resilient. Um, I attribute that to that. Do you believe that it plays a role in that? Yeah, it's not even belief. Like there, there that's been published. Like people who re, who use sauna more frequently, they get a. I forget if it was the common cold or flu. So don't don't quote me. But uh, but yeah, I mean that's a that's a. a that's been a that's a documented phenomena that people you know that that engage in sauna more frequently they less risk you know lower risk for colds or flus one of the two but um yeah there's this idea that i advanced in that chapter it's called cross adaptation which i think is really cool and this notion it's this idea that when you submit your body to a certain type of stressor that's why i call it the vigor trigger when you when you submit to a certain whether it's cold stress or heat stress the acclimation that you endure has a spillover effect into other areas of your life. So maybe it's like immune function. Maybe it's also your ability to be resilient in the face of psychological stress. Mm. You know, like if you can, if you can endure, you know, a cold shower and you practice, I don't know, maybe we can use the term progressive overload for these kinds of stimuli because totally. it's like, right, why not? So if you're like progressively overloading your, your, you know, thermal sensors or whatever with, you know, cold showers and then, you know, maybe a more intense cold water immersion, um, that, you know, conceivably is going to have a, a significant spillover effect into other areas of your life. I, I would 100% agree. I, I, one of the first things uh, clients would tell me when I train them <clears throat> is they, they just felt, besides physically stronger, they just felt stronger in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. They felt stronger at home. Um, they felt like they can handle emotional stress better. So and it's Mental fortitude. Yeah, it's just because yeah. it requires a certain level of fortitude to train yourself at a particular intensity. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense that that would apply to, you know, because it's uncomfortable being in a hot sauna and it's uncomfortable being in freezing water. So it makes perfect sense that you would have that spillover. One thing I found too with the cold water immersion, which I didn't know if like this is another thing that's documented or not, which uh, with with me, like the, the normal tendency was to, when I encountered stress was to really bear down and brace and that was something that you know from sports it was something i would always do when i was under a lot of tension or stress or even if it was from work or anything and what that does in me actually going in and going through the, the cold water it, it showed you right away that doesn't work like you really have to release and you have to be able to breathe and calm and, and find that, that that calm state and the quicker you do that the, the easier it is to stay in there and, versus the other where you're just suffering the whole time yeah I found I found exactly that. Like when I get into these cold, like I do uh, the water that I get into there, I, there's like a place in New York and a place in LA where I can get into, I can do like legit cold immersion and the temperature is about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I, I've learned exactly that, that, you know, your, your kind of gut instinct is to start to like hyperventilate. But if you just kind of like tune into your breath and like slow it down, um, it becomes a lot more bearable. 
Mm -hmm. Which sure. makes you think that it, it, it'll carry over into all stress of life, right? Yeah. right. No oh. matter what, whether it be physical or mental, emotional, you just learn to relax a little bit more in a very hyper stress state, which the think of the carryover. Yeah, I feel like I have more. like yeah. access to that now too. When I like encounter like more stressful situations, I can find that calm a little easier. Well, I mean, not That's to great. go off topic, but uh, it's oftentimes our resistance to reality is what makes it so damn yeah. difficult to begin with. So you're in this yeah. cold water. And you're resisting it like, no, that, that resistance is just making it more difficult. It's right. No such more thing as big problems, only problems that we perceive to be big. Yeah. So you just chill. All right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, no pun intended, but I'm going to just chill <laughs> yeah. here and just accept the fact that yeah, it's that cold. Worked. Yeah. And that's, I'll a, be okay. that's a line that I've actually, um, I used to do a lot of yoga like back in the day before I had the, the I messed up my lower back, but that's another story. Uh, but one of the, one of the best things I was able to take away from yoga is the idea that you just, you know, when you're in like a stressful pose, just breathe into it. Yeah. yeah. You know, they use that, th that term a lot and I really appreciate it. And I find that that term you can take to any area of your life, you know? Now, now the, the chapter that was really, that's most interesting to me personally was about all the, the toxic elements and we covered a little bit. Oh, I thought he was going to say the one he contributed to. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, yeah. Didn't yeah. it seem like he was alluding that? Like, yeah. no, no, the, the, yeah. the chapter that I thought was best was definitely the one that I could. <laughs> Well, that actually to. is next, Sal. No, so, no, there, there, is, there, there. there is an exercise segment um, to you, and it, and it makes perfect sense. Obviously, this book is all about a healthy life. Of course, you're going to talk about exercise, but the but the the chapter that had to do with the toxic compounds that we're exposed to, uh, that's very fascinating. We touched a little bit on that at the beginning of the podcast, but there's other things in there that I think um, I'd like to ask you questions about. For example, you talk about how some drugs are, and I hope I'm saying this right, are anti Cholinergic. Cholinergic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, antihistamines in particular. First of all, what does that mean? What is an anticholinergic uh, compound? What does that mean? Basically, a drug that blocks the, um, the the functioning of a neurotransmitter in the in the brain and body uh, called acetylcholine, which is important for learning and memory. Um, it's also involved in voluntary muscle control and involuntary muscle muscle control. Um, and so, you know, you'll see certain drugs like, uh, you know, to to stop incontinence, you know, that have an anticholinergic effect, but also, you know, you'll see drugs that, um, are used to treat in air quotes, uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease that are working, you know, inversely to actually increase, you know, the functioning of, of acetylcholine in the brain. But there's this whole category of drugs called anticholinergics, and there's tons of them that, you know, many of, many of these drugs people take chronically and, uh, their toxicity is well known. Um, mm. you know, any, any doctor, you know, is aware of the toxicity of too much, uh, you know, of too high of a dose of an anti, of an anticholinergic drug. But what is unsettling and why I talk about it in the book is that chronic use of anticholinergic drugs is associated with a dramatically increased risk for dementia. Mm. Um, and so it's, it would be impossible. I mean, impossible to name all of them. Um, but yeah, some of the more common ones are over the counter antihistamine drugs that are, that people take for allergies and also for sl as a sleep aid. Um, people take them all the time. Like Benadryl? Yeah. Wow. Uh, now could you, let's say you are somebody who suffers from terrible allergy. I have, I have nieces and nephews who have, uh, lots of, you know, allergies and, and really the, one of the only ways they get relief is by taking Claritin or Zyrtec on a regular basis. Um, and then when they get acute attacks, they have to take other things. Can you offset some of those and those those effects by supplementing with a high choline diet or by supplementing with acetylcholine? Do you know that if that makes a difference? Yeah, I don't think so. Mm. Um, and that is not something that I've seen in the in the literature. Okay. Um, I wouldn't think so, but I will say that there's probably um, options that if you were to go to your physician, you know, that are non anticholinergic, you, you could easily ask. Okay, got it. Yeah, interesting. You talk about um, microwaving food and plastics. Uh, this one was something I told Adam a long time ago because he would always be warming up his food in his plastic containers. Yeah. Um, what's the problem with that? Yeah, the problem is a lot of the compounds that are used to make plastic are not inert. They're able to leach into our food and heat catalyzes that that reaction. And so it's not the microwaving per se that is a problem, but um, it's it's 
heating or storing. Right, in a sense, we're melting plastic food. into our food a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You also don't want to. Um, I know that sous vide cooking is very popular among mm. among yeah. culinary mm. aficionados. Oh, it's delicious. It's a fantastic way to add plastic to your food. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, Damn I knew it. it. They so, make they make uh, uh, bags though now that are plastic plastic free. They're called uh, like silicon bags. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's now, does much- sil- what about silicone? Is there any fears with silicone leaching? I know it's one of the more stable, uh, you know, compounds, but yeah, I don't think. So, but I'm not. You know, I don't know. the pro- The problem with a lot of these compounds is that consumers become aware, and then it becomes this chemical game of whack a mole, where you know there's all next, these like replacement next, products on, yeah. the, on the market, and there's really no data either, you know, in favor of or against. So with silicone, I, you know, I don't know. Mm. What I read on silicone was that it could withstand a higher temperature, and that's mm. why it wasn't leaching in. So if I re- recall. Uh, that was the big difference, and that's what then that's what makes plastic so bad. It's not the microwave, it's not the plastic in itself. It's that at certain temperatures, it basically melts or leaches into your food, and now we're consuming some of the plastic. So I think what 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 the sous vide or the people that have that came I don't remember who the brand that came up with the product, but. I remember when I bought this movie, that was the first thing that I looked into was, okay, this can't be a good idea to put a plastic sandwich bag and throw my food in there and then boil it. I mean, that's got to be melting it in there. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. if a microwaving plastic is bad, that's got to be yeah. bad. Uh, but the silicone, I think, can handle a higher temperature than you actually boil water at. And that's, oh, what, that's, what, that's what they say, right? Um, right. Uh, you talked also in, in the book about the mercury to selenium ratio in fish. Now, this is something that I recently learned. Um, uh, I recently got married, and Jessica and I are going to be trying to have a baby soon. And one of the recommendations is be careful for eating too much fish because of the mercury content. But as you dig a little deeper, you find that selenium, when there's a high amount of selenium in fish, it offsets that a little bit. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, that's the the hypothesis. But a lot of the, 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 the primarily the early studies that were linking fish consumption to mercury toxicity. So mercury is toxic. Right. But the studies linking fish consumption to mercury toxicity all actually initially involve the pilot whale, which is not a fish but a mammal, mm. and it has far higher levels of mercury than I it does see. selenium. Um, but the most commonly available fish are going to have more selenium than mercury, and selenium is a well-known antidote to mercury toxicity because mm. mer- one of the reasons why mercury is toxic is that it binds to selenoproteins in the brain that f- serve as antioxidants. Oh, I see. Ah. Yeah, I see. So you eat you eat a fish that's high in selenium or has a better selenium to mercury ratio, probably not a problem. You definitely want to avoid king mackerel, swordfish, shark, uh, things like that. And you know, if you're pregnant, you know the 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 advice from you know authorities is to limit consumption of tuna and things like that. But tuna does have a higher selenium than mercury. Uh, you know, ratio. It does have a positive selenium to mercury ratio. So I don't think there's anything wrong with consuming tuna. Um, Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you look, uh, and I talk about these studies in the book, observationally, women who are pregnant who consume more fish and, you know, you have to imagine that most of the fish that people are consuming in this country are, you know, probably tuna is one of the most commonly consumed yeah. fish, if not the most commonly consumed fish. Women who consume more seafood have babies that come out having higher IQs and better cognitive function and things like that. Um, so I think the benefits of consuming fish outweigh the risks. And then when you look at the fish that are actually going to be the best for you because they have higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, um, like salmon and mackerel, uh, not king mackerel, but but like the regular mackerel that you would buy there, or sardines, they all have you know very low amounts of mercury in mm. them. Uh, you talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in there. What are some of the the cautions that people should should take heed to when when using those? Yeah, I think um, acute use is fine if you have like you know pain, um, and so I try to in this chapter uh, what I try to do is I definitely don't want to fear monger. That's sure. that's not my goal. But uh, these are all the kinds of compounds that I think people just like take, you know, they're not very discriminating. They just kind of assume that because they're available to us that they're safe. You know, oh, I know people take them every single day. There you go. Every yeah. single day. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I try to dissuade. I try to get my readers to think a little bit more critically and to dissuade them from just doing anything too much, you know, and mm-hmm. that includes the use of these NSAID drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which... Um, you know, they disrupt uh, enzymes that that protect the gut barrier, which is super important. Um, they are they've been shown to negatively affect the mitochondria of cardiac tissue, and they can also easily cross the blood brain barrier. And we know that mitochondrial dysfunction of neurons is one of the earliest, uh, you know, problems essentially with Alzheimer's disease. You know, the brain the brain has an uh, problems creating energy essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which is a, you know, energy is created in the mitochondria. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, I, I try to dissuade people from using them on a, on a chronic basis. There's no link between NSAID consumption and, or NSAID, NSAID use and dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So I make that, I make that caveat in the book, but I just try to get people to think more critically. And if, you know, if you do have a pain condition and you need these drugs, then by all means use these drugs. Mm. Um, yeah, but, in, in, uh, I've seen in athletic or, or performance-based studies that uh, lots of use of NSAIDs can re reduces muscle strength adaptations from exercise and yeah. has been connected to increase later on risk of tendon uh, and ligament rupture because you know they're blocking the inflammatory signal and part of that inflammatory signal is important uh, tells the body to repair and build so it can actually have a negative effect on performance if you consume them uh, too regularly yeah and i believe there's a link with regular and said use and risk for uh Colostridium difficile infection, which is like this, oh, C. Diff. you know, C. Diff, yeah, mm. causes, you know, I forget how many millions of hospitalizations every year, a significant number of deaths. Um, so you really, especially want, for the elderly, that's yeah. a big one. That's a, a lot of old, like, that's a big thing to watch out for in, um, these homes for the elderly is C. Diff. Uh, cause if that, if that has been known to kill people, um, in advanced age. Yeah. I mean, I've had like, it's better now and I've been strengthening my core and everything, but I've had like chronic low back pain for the past five years and I, I rarely will take a medication for it. I'm not saying that everybody should be like me. You know, if you have mm -hmm. pain, take med, you know, don't suffer, but I'll do, I'll jump through hoops to make sure that I don't have to take like pain medications, you mm -hmm. know, all like anti-inflammatory, like omega threes and curcumin, which there's very limited, you know, evidence that they can help treat pain, but you ever use, can you ever use cannabis or cannabinoids? Uh, I've tried some CBD because I got hooked up with your guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I can't say, I, I haven't taken it for pain, so I can't, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't comment on that. I'm not a fan of THC, uh, so I've never used that. Makes but, you paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're too smart, that's why. Is that what it is? I don't know. I've never yeah, been able real to. Real analytical thinker? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I could definitely yeah. make you paranoid yeah, yeah. if you have too much. One of the things that I enjoy talking with you, though, because you do talk about some of the fringe, borderline, what someone would say, woo-woo stuff, <laughs> but you do it in a very non-zealot way. Like it's, and I agree with your the way you present it, because it's like, you know, never in, in history have we been uh, like this where we have this many offenders. You know, one of these things by themselves, probably not going to cause cancer, probably not going to kill somebody, probably not a big deal. The occasional introduction of it here and there, but it's like you're getting bombarded by all of them. And if yeah. you're just, if you have the attitude of, and why I don't like people that try and fight with someone like you with your message and say, oh, that's bullshit. The research doesn't support that. You're fine doing that. Is you give people a free pass to just say, fuck it and go over the overboard with it. And I know being somebody who, you know, we talk about this even with like highly processed foods and things. I mean, I, w I could be using some hair products, some beard oil, uh, toothpaste, uh, microwaving six of my uh, meals all in plastic. I mean, that could be in a day drinking out of like all yeah. of the, like in, in a single day and wrapping something in the, the wax paper then now funny I'm touching receipts and you got to think that like all of that can't be good and if I can make some small changes like simply using glassware instead of plastic you know mm -hmm. or limiting the amount of drinking out of a plastic bottle and switching like it's not like I'm I'm you know trying to freak anybody out but it's like why why not why not make that better easy switch I'm not asking you to spend tons extra money you just make a, a smarter choice and limit the amount of exposure mm -hmm. you're doing yeah exactly i mean i think knowledge is power and most people live the way that you described i mean most of the time like you know people don't don't really have this information and so i think i think it's important to get it out there and you know that's that's why i take issue sometimes with uh you know, online in the fitness community, you'll see people who are like sugar apologists, you know, or yep. like junk food apologists. You probably see this all the time, but it's like, I, I don't think that we're considering the public health implications of, you know, giving this advice that sugar suddenly gets a free pass if you're, you know, counting your calories, uh, because it's just, you know, like, look at the, look at the population statistics. Well, that was the main debate we had with our buddy Lane. That's like how we got connected was, you know, his message. I mean, he just did another video the other day and I just chuckle and laugh and kind of roll my eyes like, you know, because he, he tries to take the opposing side that we demonize sugar. And so he made, did you see his video he did the other no, day? No, I didn't see Oh, it. you didn't see, he made, no. a, he made like this spoof video of 
a drug deal going down, but it was sugar. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, he's speaking to an echo chamber, right. essentially, of right. like fitness people. And I'm actually like not. I'm, you know, I get to go on the freaking Dr. Oz show, the Rachel Ray right. show, and I'm hyper aware of the fact that I'm reaching like the masses. Right. You know, and I'm like to give them a free pass to eat more sugar. What? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you don't want what? to do yeah. that. Well, and that's how, that was our big debate, you know, that we had with him was that, you know, for two decades, we changed the the average Joe's. You know how many competitors and pro athletes I got to train? Like f- fucking less than a percent. Like one. Yeah. yeah, the other 99 plus percent were average Jane and Joe's. And those people can't be hearing that message. I can't be promoting to them that like, yeah, if you train like me and do all this, so then go ahead, eat all the sugar you want as long as it fits in your macros. Like that message is not ideal for the, for the, the masses. And it's the small popular and so i think that was that was our if, big debate with him is exactly that yeah is, if you control your calories and your macros tightly sure you can get away with uh, with certain things but the average person doesn't even know what a macro is let alone exactly you yeah. know controlling it tightly and heavily processed high sugar foods are hyper palatable and encourage you to eat more so when you take somebody who doesn't control these things super tightly, weigh and measure everything, and you tell them sugar is okay so long as your calories are, are, are not that high, what the average person ends up doing is eating that sugar, makes them want to eat more, and they, un- they underestimate how many calories they're eating anyway. So now they have a lot of sugar, and it's in the context of a high-calorie diet, which is extremely inflammatory and just generally bad. So it's just terrible advice because you have to, you have to know – who you're talking to. It's like you have to know your audience. And this is how we communicate like artificial sweeteners. That's a great one. You see people taking out their their high sugar sodas and replacing them with artificial sweeteners and they don't lose any weight. Is that because artificial sweeteners can't cause weight gain? No, but it's because they make you eat more. So am I going to tell my client to switch out their sugar for artificial sweeteners? No, because I know it's just going to make them eat more and I'm working with the average person. That's a very important thing and I think you do a very good job uh, of, of, of talking to that person and not being in that echo chamber. Thanks, so, man. I really appreciate that. Appreciate you coming on the show again, bro. Yeah. 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 I'm excited for this book. When is it go- coming out? comes out March 17th. It's called The Genius Life. If you go to geniuslifebook.com, we've got some great goodies uh, that we're giving out, like free bonuses. And um, But the book is available everywhere. It's called The Genius Life. And I'm uh, on Instagram, at Max Lugavir. L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. And then I've also got my podcast called The Genius Life also. And I know that you've been on it. I love it. Can't wait to have you back. Oh, I love coming on your podcast. We always have great discussions. Now, can people pre-order the book now? They can pre-order the book right now. Okay, cool. Oh, very cool. And uh, did you know you were going to write this one when you wrote the first one? Or did you write the first one that had no idea you were going to write about everything like you were in this one? Uh, I did not know that I was going to write a second book. And so the first one was pretty dense. But what I did was in, there's like slight overlap uh, in the second book. But what I did was I expanded on those topics. So, for example, like I go deep into, you know, exercise. And that was a chapter that I was super psyched to get to collaborate with you on. I sent it to you because I was like, God, the last thing I need is like the fitness community catching an error <laughs> in, my, in my in my text. I was like, God forbid I say that you can only achieve hypertrophy in like the right. you know, eight to 10 rep range when we know, you know, <laughs> so I sent that to you. Thank you for, for, uh, yeah, no problem. for like, you know, being serving as a form of checks and balances, but no, yeah, it's, um, nutrition, genius foods was like a nutritional Bible. And then, mm-hmm. you know, what I realized is that nutrition is just one part of the story. Like the, if you're, you could be like checking, you know, all the T's and dotting all the I's, you know, in terms of your nutrition. But if you're not at least conscious of the, of the fact that these endocrine disrupting chemicals exist, or if you're not aware of what protein can do in terms of satiating your hunger or, you know, getting adequate light in during, you know, in the morning or, or, you know, giving yourself a break from it in the evening, there's like all these different factors. And then I go into mindset, um, and stress relief and how to optimize sleep and all that stuff in the book. Cause I mean, these are all, I think crucially important. Yeah, and the mm-hmm. way you write is is uh, I, I consider this an, an ama- a great guide to improving your overall health. It's easy to understand, and the way you communicate it, you don't communicate the the small insignificant. You communicate things in the right way. Like here's what you can do realistically, and I really appreciate that you did that. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that living a life of counting calories is a I don't I don't consider that a genius life. I think that people need to people ought to know how to eat 
And um, unfortunately, we live in a time where the food supply has become essentially toxic. You know, I mean, we're, we're thrown health claims from every conceivable angle. Um, we're being implored to overeat. You know, we're, we're, we're sold things and we're, we're compelled to buy things that we don't need, you know, almost every single day, multiple times a day. And so I think sometimes it's just like the little insights, the little tricks that people need to have an actual like a marked difference in their lives in terms of how they feel and their health down the down the road. So I try to pepper uh, the genius life with just tons and tons of those sort of actionable tips and tricks and counterintuitive things that people might not necessarily think about, but that are going to lead to big health wins. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Can't so, wait to see you crush. Thanks, yeah, man. man. Thanks I appreciate again. you guys so Thank much. You.